couple last little things. All right. Hey, how's it going, everybody? I am writer director Corey Reader. I want to say welcome to Scene to Screen, a show about the basics of screenwriting. Each week, I gather a diverse panel of TV staff writers, showrunners, screenwriters, producers currently working in the industry. And uh, what we're going to do is discuss the skills and the craft of screenwriting while making sure that the conversation stays inclusive. So if you're a new writer, this show is for you. If you're a person with a disability or a person of color, you're LGBTQ, this show is for you. Or if you're an experienced cisgender white dude like me, this show is also for you. We all got something to learn. You may have noticed this uh, lovely woman next to me with the flying fingers of fury. This is our ASL interpreter, Mona Jean Cedar. Mona, how are you doing? And uh, let's see, every, every show I'm going to have an unofficial sponsor until someone decides to give me some money and actually sponsor me for this thing. Or if not, that's okay. Uh, this week, the unofficial sponsor is Safe Driving. Yeah, Safe Driving. Uh, so look, I know that uh, traffic across the country has like mellowed out. And uh, especially here in Los Angeles, where you're usually stuck in a traffic jam, just trying to go to the liquor store. But uh, people, slow your roll. This is not Grand Theft Auto, all right? You know, a buddy of mine almost got ran over this morning and there was barely any traffic. So you have to slow the fuck down, all right? I know we're all stressed out, but now more than ever, we got to pay attention. Be cool, pop an edible before you get behind the wheel, throw on some Bob Marley and just, uh, you know, cruise to wherever you got to go. Okay. Cause there's enough, enough people dying from COVID. We don't need anybody out there dying on their way to go get toilet paper. So with that drive safe, let's introduce our panel. All right. Our first panelist is Catherine Beatty. Catherine Beatty, come on into the room. Hey, Corey. Hi. How Thank you doing? You it's a pleasure to be here. Catherine, I am going to set a timer for 60 seconds, and I would love for you to introduce yourself to our audience. Ready, set, go. Sure. Um, my name is Catherine Beatty. I am originally from the Pasadena area of Los Angeles, and I am 34 years old. Um, I went to college in Texas at Texas Christian University because I knew I was going to come back to LA uh, to write television, and I wanted to see something new. Um, so I did that and I've been working in TV since I graduated college in 2008. Um, I am quarantining alone and I really wish I had a dog, uh, but I don't. Um, and yeah, what else? Uh, I'm disabled, I use a wheelchair. Um, I have cerebral palsy. Um, I like to surf and oh, I don't know if I said I'm a, uh, executive story editor on NCIS New Orleans. Um, do I have time left? You have eight seconds. Oh, um, thank you for making this chat more accessible by providing ASL interpretation. My pleasure. Oh, right, right at the bell. Uh, Catherine, just a side note, my wife and I just got a dog. So when it's able to go outside, if you need a puppy to play with, you're happy to have her energy for a day because she's thank a you. freaking chaotic mess. <laughs> All right. Um, next up is Gerald Cuesta. Come on down. Hey, what's up, Gerald? Where am I? Hey. Right where you need to be. Uh-oh, he's gone. He's back. All right, you ready? I'm going to give you 60 seconds, Gerald. Tell us who you are. On your mark, get set, go. Oh, we can't hear you. You're muted. You're muted. No. Uh, there you go. Again, tech, tech, technology. My name is Gerald Cuesta. I'm um, originally from the Bronx, uh, New York. I currently live in Chicago. Uh, I, I lived in LA for about five years, which is where I met Corey. Um, I am a writer. Um, my last show was, uh, I was on a show called Filthy Rich on Fox. I was a supervising producer, uh, writer, and uh, it's a, the Fox show premieres in September, this September. Uh, we finished, we wrapped up everything uh, in February. And uh, before that, I was on a show called Star, uh, Lee Daniels show. 
Um, before that, I was on a show called Ice. Uh, I've done two uh, independent films that I co-wrote, uh, L.I.E. Uh, with Brian Cox and Paul Dano. And um, I co-wrote a movie called Roadie with Bobby Cannavale and uh, Jill Hennessy and Ron Eldard. Uh, and then, yeah, I've, I've been lucky enough to sell a number of pilots that have not gotten on the air. And um, that's your and that's time. And that's my that's time. your time. And, and I have a bulldog. And yeah, <laughs> but you're in Chicago, so that's tough to let the bulldog go and visit Catherine. <laughs> um, next up is Tess Gattuso. Come on down, Tess. Hi. Hey. You ready? Yep. 60 seconds and go. Hello, I'm Tess. I'm a contributor to Reductress and recently got a comedy pilot on We For She's 2021's to watch list. I've written for Disney Princess, Awesomeness TV, Baz Lev Screen Reality Studio, and wrote and voiced cartoons at Toonstar. I was re uh, recently worked as a content producer for Comedy Central show Lights Out with David Spade. I got my start as a writer's PA for Jessica Jones after I graduated from college with a double major in political science and feminist and gender studies. I'm also super active on Instagram where I post original memes and videos every day. And um, before quarantine, I was a musical improviser at Second City. I'm super queer. And um, thanks for having me alongside these really impressive people. <laughs> Appreciate it. Awesome, thanks Tess. Uh, is queer different from super queer? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Good to know. I, 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 I'm not beyond learning new things in my own life. Awesome, <laughs> welcome. And last but not least, Jen Durwinson. Oh God, I fucked up your name, I apologize. <laughs> Jen Durwinson. There you go, that's good. Sorry. <laughs> welcome Thank you. to Scene to Screen. Tell us about yourself. You got 60 seconds, go. 60 seconds. Um, let's see, I was born in LA, but I grew up in Northern California in Mount Shasta, which is um, a volcano, 14,000 foot volcano and rumored to be home of aliens, Bigfoot, the descendants of Atlantis and uh, a panther who turns into Jesus Christ. So it was either, I either would, you know, go into writing genre or uh, join a cult. It was. Uh, that was the choice. So um, let's see, I moved back down to LA to go to film school many moons ago. Uh, my first job in television was as a writer's assistant on The Dead Zone, a USA Network show. And uh, after that, I wrote uh, a few features back when you could um, do that for money. <laughs> that was before the last writer strike. Um, and then that stopped happening. So then I transitioned into uh, television and doing more directing. I actually, after I graduated from college, I started off as a theater director. So uh, moved into television, did some more directing. Uh, most recently, I uh, wrote on season two of Black Summer, the Netflix show, which was in production when the lockdown came. Ooh, and that's your time. <laughs> well, uh, I gotta say, if quarantine has done one good thing, it's been able to, uh, you know, bring people like you guys into my life, even if it's only for an hour. Um, so I'm, I'm grateful for that. I'm grateful for you guys here. Um, let's get into it. Um, thanks for being here. Uh, this week, I wanna talk about prep, organization and research. No general goes to war without a plan. No chef prepares a feast without a recipe and no clown goes to a party without a pocket full of balloons. So the best way to ensure success is to have a plan. How do we do this as screenwriters? Bibles, breakdowns, outlines, the hero's journey, three acts, seven points, which one is right for you and for your story to, and for you to tell your story. So this episode is gonna be about setting yourself up for success before you ever even type fade in. Um, Jen, I'd like to start off with you. Uh, last week, we talked a lot about ideas and idea creation and where do they come from. So when you've got an idea and you're setting out to write a film um, or, or start off on a season of a TV show, um, how do you flesh out those ideas and begin to organize them? Do you start with like a word cloud or do you just type out a vomit draft of, of a screenplay uh, to see where it goes? What's, what's your style? How, how's, how do you organize your thoughts? Um, it really depends on the project for me. Um, 
for example, I, I'm developing a pitch that's based on a true story and based on real people. And that just involved a lot of research and a lot of taking notes. And then a lot of figuring out what a structure would be that would actually suit the story that I wanted to tell. And I've actually been through a few versions of that and, you know, looking at comps and, you know, trying to see if I could steal a structure from, from a, another show and modify it in a way that would work for me in the story that I wanted to tell. Um, but another thing I'm working on um, actually started as a joke um, up when I was on location in Spokane, Washington for Z Nation. And that one was just, it was so over the top and kind of so weird and out there, I kind of felt like, well, if I try to outline this before I write it, I might run the risk of, I don't know, sort of like pinning down a butterfly. I feel like, you know, sometimes when it's very tempting when you're, you start off with an outline to sort of let things fall into, I don't know, something you've seen before, basically. And so in that case, I just started writing a draft. And I've done that before, and you sometimes are able to get some kind of more original ideas that way, but then it does take a lot more work to then go back and sort of reverse engineer the structure and the outline after you've kind of figured out what the what the story is. So it, it really depends for me, yeah. So that's that that's an interesting point that you bring there is, is that a lot of times if you just kind of put it out, like I know particularly my, my brain will get locked in, all right, this is the structure. And, and it prohibits us from looking outside the box that we've put ourselves in. So Catherine, when you're working on a show and, uh, and, and you have some sort of an outline, um, it, it, how do you make sure that the writing process, there's still freedom in it, that you're not locked into anything too, too specific? Mm -hmm. um, well, on NCIS New Orleans, um, you know, it's a CBS procedural, We've been on six seasons now, so it's like kind of a, more of an older style of show that they're not really doing much anymore. But um, the structure is pretty, you know, rigid. We have um, a teaser in four acts, for all intents and purposes, five acts. Um, and we pretty much know, you know, after doing 150 of them, you pretty much know where all your beats are going to be. Um, but like within those, um, scenes to get to those beats. It's about kind of keeping that um, interesting, you know, and keeping the audience guessing. So like it's, you, you, you find moments and then if you're lucky, if you have a strong character story, you can like subvert a beat um, that the audience isn't expecting after all of those, you know, episodes that they're like, oh, I see where this is going. But you get, you have an opportunity to do something different um, to kind of reveal something cool about a character. Um, and I saw we, I, I don't have Mona Jean on my screen. I don't know if we love yeah, her. Yeah, I, I, just, I just noticed that too. So um, I'm gonna shoot her a text. On that, uh, you used a term, which uh, if you could take a second to mm -hmm. define, can you tell our audience in case they don't know? Oh, she's back. Hey, Mona Jean. Uh, really quick, can you define as you're, as you're breaking out, yeah, like you talked about the, the teaser and then the, three act structure, mm -hmm. but what do you mean by beats? Uh, so in like how we define beats is um, pretty much uh, just the, the big scene, the big part of the scene, you know, that, uh, that happens in each act. So our general structure for our show is we have five acts and most of those, um, most of those acts have about five to six scenes in them. And then the beats are just those important points in the scene that you want to hit um, to either reveal something about your character or move your story forward um, or reveal some action. Okay, cool. Uh, quick check-in, Mona Jean, are you doing okay? Uh-oh, it looks like she might have frozen again. Oh no. Yeah. Okay, well, hey, let me, uh, hopefully we'll be able to work this out with Mona Jean. If not, I'll make a point to go back and uh, make sure that in the next few days we have subtitles on everything that we're saying. Um, technology, can't do anything about it. Yeah. The show must go on. So let me move over to Gerald. 
Gerald, I got a question for you. Um, there's, as you said at the beginning, we've known each other for about five years. I've been able to read a lot of your stuff. And there's something that always strikes me about the things that you write is that it has such a rich tone and, um, and, and you capture the worlds uh, that you write really well. So uh, in particular, I'm thinking of something that you wrote that takes place in the 70s and in New York. So it's very seedy New York. Um, so you have an idea of where you want the story to go, but it's set in this particular world or this particular time. How much research do you do on that? And, and, and what kind of research do you do? You got to unmute yourself, brother. There you go. Hello. Uh... The uh, I'm like somebody else said before, it depends on the project, you know, um, for that particular project, I was a um, I was a 13 year old foot messenger and a janitor at a photo studio in New York in 1977, 78. Um, so uh I'm kind of ratting myself out here and make myself look bad, but I used to take my uh, the money that I made and spend it in the peep shows and all that stuff as a 14 year old male and buying drugs. Uh, that's where I developed a drug habit and so forth and so on. Um, so I kind of lived that life and hung around there in that world. Um, so that was my research happened at the age of 13, 14 years old um, for that particular thing. Um, yeah. Like it depends on the project. Like, um, this other script, my spec script, that's got me my last job and has been uh, is being was being shopped around until uh, this, the crisis, um, is based on a murder that happened when I was in junior high school to a girl that I knew, um, and it was it was an unsolved murder. So I just take that. I and also Corey, you know, honestly, it's like um, in terms of tone and stuff like that. I'm a frustrated photographer and a frustrated painter. Um, so whenever I write a script, I have a visual first. That's just the way I work. It always starts with a visual in my head of something. Um, the new script, the script, well, a script I'm writing right now began with, I had an image of an old lady in a tree singing, uh, Guantanamera, the, uh, Cuban folk song. Mm -hmm. It just, it, it came to me when I was getting an MRI. <laughs> so... I just said, I'm going to, I don't know where it's going to go, but I'm going to start there, you know? Um, so yeah, research, like, okay, when I'm working on a, if, if I'm getting too long, just cut me off. If I, uh, when I'm working on a network show and I've, all the shows I've worked on, except for one, this ice thing, which was a cable show, everything else has been uh, broadcast. Um, much like Catherine, you know, it's, it's for a broadcast network. So it's kind of in a certain format and stuff. Um, and the last show I was on was about Southern Evangelicals. Um, so yeah, just so I get more of a feel, I watched a lot of Joel Osteen. Uh, watched, you know, and went back, watched some old Robert Schuler, you know, yeah. mega church, mega church stuff. Um, so I did that kind of research. Um, it, like, again, it all depends on what the project is. Let me, let me jump into this as, as like a general question for all you guys. And then I have a specific question for you, Tess, is when when you're in the process of writing something and you know we can go to popular culture things like gerald had mentioned watching joel osteen if you got to write some evangelical stuff have you ever found yourself writing something that you thought was uh you know uh just oh this i i saw this on tv once or i read this in in one person's book of of this cultural thing and then further down the line, you got to back it up. So you have to basically do your research after you've outlined or written the production. Um, another place that this falls in my mindset is, you know, talking, I have conversations with people who write about, um, oh, Mona Jean's coming back, who people who try to write disability, but they don't know anybody that has a disability. So they have to walk back certain things. Uh, or, or shift the character in certain ways. Have you guys ever experienced anything like that where you wish there was more research up front because it kicked you in the ass on the backside? Go for it, Jen. Um, yeah, that happened. My last episode of Z Nation had a strong Native American plot line mm -hmm. and it came off a first, actually it was a, an episode we broke the first season but didn't end up shooting until the second season that took place near the Grand Canyon. And 
Um, there was this whole spirit walking thing <laughs> in the first episode that was presented as something sort of Native American-ish, but wasn't really. And But the showrunner was really into having that in the episode that I wrote and then ended up directing as well. And so I really spent a lot of time with, um, I directed a, a short film that uh, had a Native American storyline. And so I spent a lot of time with that writer producer and with the lead actress for both Native to kind of talk to them about how I could do this story <laughs> in a way that would satisfy what the showrunner wanted to do, but in a way that would be respectful and representative and and all that. So there was a lot of kind of reverse engineering that I had to do in my episode to kind of say, okay, this is the same idea as the episode that you remember, but presented in a way that I, that I think hopefully turned out um to be more respectful and, and representative so Got yeah it. <laughs> Got it. Nice. can Welcome i, back, can I throw G. something in can, can i throw <laughs> yeah, something go in for there it. real go, quick go for it joe i i just want to say that i think wikipedia is one of the worst things that's happened to writers <laughs> um and and the reason i say that is and i i'm guilty of it it makes i i found it and i've talked to other writers about this and maybe it's not you the other folks on the call but uh, um, I talked to other writers about it. It kind of makes us lazy in terms of getting like, real research because you can get the top line about anything really fast. And then, you know, you put it into your script. It seems right. Um, that, uh, so I, I'm going to use that, that top line to jump over to a question about Tess because I think it, uh, she does a lot of work in, in stuff that is very hip, very now, and uh, headline culture, <laughs> uh, clickbait is very hip and very now. Um, so Tess, you have a lot of experience working in animation and other like new media formats that are, they have to be contemporary. They have to be hot while the fire is still hot. Um, what's, what's the organizational thought process of uh, when, you're, when you're in a room where you're coming up with your own ideas of being able to put these out there um, and make sure everything's contemporary? Yeah. Um, so, okay. It depends on whether I'm doing this on my personal time, like my personal content that is associated with me, or I'm being paid by somebody. Because if I'm working with like Awesomeness or Toonstar, they have a team of people that are researching what is trending right now. Like their marketing department is coming up with the topics. And then they go to the creative people and they say, what's a joke you can make about this? What's a story you can tell about this? It's also kind of fascinating because often the topics that they're conjuring from all this like research, they're just topics that all generations adore. Like something that people are always asking me to write about is we want a story about someone that is ditching school because kids love that these days. And it's like, well, I just- Brenna, well, I don't know about days. these days because basically every day is a ditch day right now. <laughs> yeah, well, well, that's the thing is like, right when quarantine was starting, the people I was talking with who are making content were like having a crisis, like trying to figure out how do we joke about quarantine? How do we write about quarantine in a way that is super sensitive? Because we can think of jokes about quarantine that actually might offend some people or this mm. can't come from this person's voice. This has to come from this person's voice, you know? Cause nobody, no one right now loves hearing stay inside from somebody that lives in a mansion, you know? Yeah, yeah. But, but somebody with a platform that is more like relatable can make that joke. So it's yeah. really, people are just like pulling research in a way they haven't before because we have all these new platforms that are taking in literal data on like what is getting clicks, what is getting likes and shared, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. When you, um, and I, I, just to jump in here, anybody that's watching on our YouTube stream, you can feel free to leave a question for any of our panelists in the comment section. And uh, we're gonna save about 15 minutes here at the end to be able to ask them any questions you guys want. And uh, yeah, so start firing your questions this way so we can have them ready to go. Um, so that's, so if someone's, it, it's, this can go into bigger writer's room stuff too that everybody here has experienced when you come in and you say like, this is the season arc or whatever. But when you have to come up with your own stuff that has to be a hot button topic in the now, how are you, um, 
like quality checking or validating that, that this is going to be like on topic for yourself. Cause awesomeness hasn't said like, here's what's going right now. Here's what's fire, you yeah. know, right to well, that. It's interesting. I really believe in keeping things super personal because especially if you have an identity where you haven't traditionally been given a platform, the experiences you have it, you're having are common, they are shared. And even though people are telling you they're niche, they're not niche. They just haven't been given the opportunity to be shared. So like share it however you can, because I think a lot of it will resonate with a lot of people. So I'm not, I'm not necessarily like strategizing, like I'm gonna make a video about a pretentious artist. I'm gonna make a video about a feminist who is only feminist because they're cool. I'm just like, oh, these are things I've seen, but they haven't been made fun of yet. So I'm gonna do it. Mm -hmm. Got it. Very cool. I think um, for like those of us that are working in writers' rooms and de developing our own stuff, where the timeline is a little bit longer, I really believe in keeping it personal um, and writing. You know what resonates with you because if I hear, oh, people love Z Nation, I'm gonna write a zombie show. By the time I get, I finish it and get it to somebody who might be interested, there's gonna be five zombie shows on the air, and nobody's gonna want another one. So if you're always chasing like what's in you're especially if you're like a lower level like myself and you don't have like the pull to just get something on the air you're gonna be constantly missing that boat so it really is just about like writing the thing that resonates with you and hopefully it's going to resonate with somebody else out there I have, I have a weekly writers group that i we get together and we just talk for about an hour and talk about our different stuff and week two of quarantine one of the girls vented like venom. She's like, all of my friends are writing quarantine movies. Really? <laughs> all of them. And I was just like, oh, so I would just say like right now, don't, if you, if you got the idea, don't even start. Like, <laughs> no, but you know, that's an interesting thing you say though. Oh yeah. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, no, no. What, what are you going to throw in there, Gerald? No, I, mean, I, I didn't, I didn't put a buzzkill on your quarantine idea, did I? <laughs> no, because I'll be honest, the last thing in the world I want to write is a quarantine thing. Oh, wow. And I, I can honestly say that I am worried that is everything going to be, have to be in one way, shape, or form about what we're going through right now, um, which I'm, I, I would actually find incredibly limiting. Look, this is a World War II moment, of course, I know, and I understand that, you know. But they did make other movies uh, during World War II that had nothing to do with World War well, II. Yeah, I think people want singing in the rain. They don't want. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll echo. I'll, yeah. I'll echo something that I heard them say again on a plug for script notes. Uh, they were talking about look after 9/11, there there were some 9/11 movies, but there were a lot of other movies that came out. It, not everything was 9/11 based, and so there will be plenty of space for things that are not quarantine based in this, so. Right, and it's interesting because like Homeland is ending, you know, and I, uh, we have a friend who's an actor on the show, uh, Corey and I, who's a regular on the show. Um, a family member of mine was involved with the show for a long time too. Um, but it was interesting watching the second to last episode and I'm curious to see how it ends up where I'm watching the show and in the midst of what we're going through right now, it seems so irrelevant. Mm -hmm. at the moment wouldn't it, it be amazing so if irrelevant. wouldn't it be amazing if it wrapped up with them like you know having the flight recorder and then a pandemic starts they'd be like just so <laughs> far ahead of it well let's right. let's just let's jump back on writing i want i want to stay Sorry. stay stay on topic uh jennifer when when you're coming into a new season of z nation or uh you're pitching a show you're, you're coming up with uh, season one episode one of, of a fresh idea of yourself, uh, for yourself. How do you, is there a particular way that you map out the big elements that need to take place? Like, do, do you, if, if you see the big picture, um, you know, that there's gonna be, you know, it's a normal world, zombies come, and then what's gonna happen by the end of season one? So you have that, how do you, how do you map that out? Is it like how detailed is the breakdown before other people start coming into the process? Let's let's keep it in the realm of TV because there's more rooms and more writers involved for something like that. Um, all right. Well, I just uh, I guess going back to 
to Z Nation where we had, you know, multiple seasons and I was on every season from the first season to the last. Usually, you know, if you're working in episodic and you're on the staff, then the showrunner usually has an idea of the overall arc of the season. Um, and then we would spend some time going, okay, you know, much the same way as Catherine was talking about sort of beating out a show. Um, you would do the same for season. Like what are the main tentpole events that are gonna happen in this season? What are we gonna, going to see um, in terms of plot, in terms of each character? Um, you know, how, how are we gonna get from where we are at the end of last season to the end of this season that the showrunner has, has just pitched? And what are the steps along the way? And then once we had a general idea and at that point you also know how many episodes you have so you have a general idea of what needs to happen and how you're going to pace that out between the episodes um then we would spend some time um in with each character and what was going to happen to them and it, over this course of the season what their character arc was during the season and then spend you know a lot of time just pitching episode ideas um, and with Z Nation, there was always like, what are the new zombies going to be and how are they going to come about <laughs> and that kind of thing. And then once you had all these different ideas, this is what's going to happen to this character. This is the thing that's going to happen midway through the season. These are the, the kind of, you know, fun, weird zombie shit that we want to see. Then we would start matching those things up for a particular episode. All right. In all right. this episode, we see this. This plot point, we see this happening to this character that you know is what drives that plot point and that kind of that kind of thing. Just so it's sort of a sorting <laughs> yeah. process at that point. So, uh, so you take the the over arc that the that the showrunner brings in. You then define where you want your tentpole, what the tentpole story moments are going to be, where the characters are, mm -hmm. and then and then it start. It has to be divvied up into episodes. So. Right. Catherine, when things are divvied up into episodes for NCIS New Orleans, um, that like there's the, there's a term a breaking story, mm -hmm. like where where you got to break the episode and you break it in. You, you talked about uh, breaking it into the different sections and the beats, but um, what I guess what is the technical aspect of that? So whether someone is writing a short story, uh, a, a, a pilot that they want to pitch or a feature film, we need to break it into these elements. So you said like a cold open and things like that. And then there's the beats that are in between. Within that structure, if, if you could walk me sort of through what that process is of breaking story and what, what the components are and where in that process do you get to put yourself or your voice, especially in a formulaic setting that, that an episodic is or procedural. Yeah, I mean, our, our process sounds very similar to what Jen was outlining for the season long. And then in terms of individual episodes, um, we've uh, we've done it several different ways. We have a, a couple different showrunners and they all have different styles. Um, for most of our seasons, uh, they would assign the episodes ahead of time. So for instance, I would know that I was writing episode eight. So when episode eight was up on the board, it would be my turn to get up there and to lead the room and to pitch the ideas um, and, you know, basically go with whatever I could get pitched to the showrunner that I wanted to do. Um, this last season, actually, we um, broke all, the episode all together. And then once it was broken, it was assigned to a writer. So that's a little bit of, of a different process of getting your own voice in there. But I'll just use the first example because that's what we did for most of it. Um, you know, you have your your big your big navy story, and then your personal story, and then it's it's your room. So if you have a personal uh, connection to the to the material, that's really your opportunity to say like, this is the point of view that I, you know, want to inject with this, and this is why, and this is why I think it's going to be better um, for our, our characters. If it's the other way then you really just have to be very vocal about saying like, I think this would be great for this episode. And if it doesn't fit in there, you know, and it's a story you really want to tell, then you try it again the next week. And, um, you know, just, it's just always about being willing to tap into, I think, whatever emotion you think fits best with that episode story. 
Okay, cool. Which, uh, when someone hands you, or, or when you're assigned, I shouldn't say hands you, uh, the particular episode to write, and you're up there and you're pitching it, is, is it with the rest of the writers? Can they help? Like, do you, do you develop it or is it really you? Like you're just flying the ship alone saying like, and then this, and then this, and someone says, nope. And you're like, uh, and yeah, yes, and. Uh, it, it depends on the show. Our show has a writer's room. So we work, it, 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 like say it was my episode and I knew that ahead of time. I'm leaving the room, but it is a, it's a group effort. Um, and the other shows don't have a room. So all of their writers break their episodes separately. But on our show, it very much is a group effort until the episode is broken, all the beats are on the board, and then that writer goes off to outline. And then at that point, they're largely on their own. Okay. Gerald, uh, was the process, as, as he takes a big old drink of coffee, is the process similar when you were working on Star and is it Filthy Rich? Like, were, were you working, is that a singular writing process or was that also a writer's room? Was there any anything different with your experience? No, they, uh, they were both Fox shows uh, and, you know, Fox's um, teaser and 5X actually um, was their format, which kind of threw us for a loop because we were writing to a teaser in 4X and then halfway through the season, they said, no, what are you doing? Um, but um, what we would do on, on Star, I don't want to talk about Star. It was a very chaotic show, to be honest. Uh, it was <laughs> no, really don't talk uh, about I it was, then. I was on. I was only on the first season, and it was it was a really strange um, experience. Um, but on Filthy Rich, which was an amazing experience, um, the showrunner, you know, they had the they he had co-written the pilot with Tate, uh, the uh, filmmaker Tate Taylor. Uh, and they had um, a very rough idea of where they wanted the season to go. Uh, the pilot was already done, obviously. And um, ahead of time, he broke it up and assigned everybody an episode before we broke anything. He had a thing on a board. You're going to write this. You're going to write this. You're going to write this. Which he then shifted and changed as he got to know our strengths, each person's you know, um, strengths, um, to fit it better. But it was it was such a collaborative process that I can honestly say that the episodes that have my name on them as written by, um, I still say they were written by the room. I basically, um, you know, I gave a feeling toward the dialogue and I have a certain prose style, whatever. Um, but each episode was written by the room. Um, everybody got everybody got their own scripts with credit and so forth and so on. But it was such a collaborative process that. When it came down to, oh, Gerald is writing this script, I was typing up what we did in the room. It was really a matter of just taking that and uh, doing it. It was a really beautiful, um, best working experience I've ever had uh, with an incredible group of people uh, that was so collaborative. And I know it's not like that all the time because, yes. um, like I said, I had been in another writer's room that was completely the opposite. Um, one of the things that I find interesting about writer's rooms uh, is it's so important to have good, well, of course it's important to have good people. There is so much opportunity for ego and backstabbing and agendas in a writer's room, I found. Um, and if you can get past all of that and get the right mix of people, you can really have a magical experience. But I've been told that the, uh, the experience that I had was actually um, uh, the exception. Unfortunately. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I think a lot of the people that are picking up uh, their first copies of Celtex or Final Draft or Highland 2, whatever they're going to start writing in, uh, they're probably they're, they're, they're dreaming of getting getting into those sort of uh, worrisome situations in writing rooms. So uh, let's let's hope yeah. that no one ever has to go through those. But no, but, but I'm just saying it's like if you if you stay open and collaborative, it's a beautiful thing. Yeah, I really I believe so. It's it's one of the greatest experiences I've had was uh, a bunch of artists and creative people being collaborative with one another and sharing. It was really great. Nice. So cool. go for it. Tess, um, so you have a, a unique experience amongst us that you've been able to work on a show that was a daily show when you were working on Lights Out with uh, David Spade. And that means that has its whole other set of circumstances, not only having to write, uh, uh, schedule things, <laughs> My dog, I, if I could catch my dog who has the zoomies right now, Catherine, I'll show him to you. Uh, he keeps on running around my feet. 
Um, so when you work on a daily show like that, um, you, you have to you have to be organized. You have to have your thoughts like lined up in a row. What what are some of the unique um, circumstances that you had to deal with, and how do you um, how do you manage that and keep keep your head around all the things that have to happen when yeah. a show has to be produced every day? So daily jokes basically is the challenge here is that you're waking up every morning and churning out because I was a content producer so everything I was making was living on their Instagram but I had to come I had to like meet a quota and have everything into them um by noon and you like before you get a job like that you're usually practicing for years be it on like improv stages or your own stuff or freelance gigs and you're coming up with like everything that's coming my way, I have to be able to come at it from a humorous angle. That's like, that's comedy writing, that's being a comedian. And usually when you have like a unique point of view and you're able to think critically about the way the world works or something that happened, that's where like the humor comes from is like, what about this makes me angry? What about this makes me wanna cry? What about this like, gives me like the urge to be violent and like, so usually, you know, you're, you're a writer already, you're an emotional person. So you're just kind of like accessing the critical part of your brain every day and then churning out jokes and you just like you get better at it and you get faster at it with practice. Okay, nice, nice. Um, I, I wanna break out a few terms before we go into uh, some audience questions here. Um, different things that are uh, generated when uh when you know prepping stuff is that you have like a bible or a pitch deck um uh, i think when we started off jen you talked about a show that you're getting ready to pitch um obviously in all forms of writing and not just screenwriting there's outlines but um would anybody like to discuss are are these things are the are character breakdowns like are these things that you do before you start writing as you try to sort of like world build or are these things that for you guys come along the way? If it's, if it's your own work, obviously if you're coming onto something that's a, a series, you're, you're, someone will have defined like, well, this is Cookie and Cookie's gonna do this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. If you're developing a pitch, um, then you're gonna have, uh, character documents and you're going to want to be able to, you know, very concisely and clearly explain who the characters are and have what their dynamic is, is and how that dynamic is going to drive the show. Yeah. For me in my own work, which is not at all procedural, actually the last couple things that I've written have been half hour comedies or, or dramedies. Um, and I always, it might start with like the idea of the show might start with a particular like scene or like a, a world, but I always start after that with the characters. I sit down and figure out who my characters are first before I figure out what situations they're going to get in. Um, so like for me, the character breakdown in my own work is one of the most important um, steps before I can move on to the next process. Do any of you guys rely on visuals ever? I know we already talked about Wikipedia being a whole shit show to have to jump into, but um, do you ever, spent like huge visuals like i go to a museum to try to get inspired or well, <laughs> not oh quarantine, yeah you know before before quarantine immersing yourself like in an experience or with folks who are really familiar with whatever world world you're trying to build i think is really helpful if, if, if it's accessible to you and as long as you're like respecting the people that are welcoming you into the world like if you want to write about witches. Like I was gonna write something about witches. So I met people who were having a witch meeting and they let me into their church and like told me about the spells and their rocks and their stones. It was like really kind of them to do that. And if you have access to that, it's, it's an experience you can give yourself to better like inform the characters that you're writing. Um, okay. And on the Wikipedia note, I do love JSTOR. Does anyone use JSTOR? No, what's no. JSTOR? What is it? I don't oh, know. What really? It is. I mean, um, it's it's all uh, research papers written by academics on anything and everything. So, like, I recently needed to learn about torture in the Middle Ages, and there's this guy in Italy who is an expert on all the different torture devices in the Middle Ages and had written on them extensively, and he has his PhD in it. 
So that's like, that's my version of Wikipedia. <laughs> yeah, I have something, I think it's like academia.org or something. And so I've done some research that way and then I'll get notifications like, oh, there's a new paper on the thing that you were researching and that's really cool, yeah. Oh, nice. It's really helpful for like factual information. Yeah. yeah. All right. Thank you. I'm going to um, use that. Well, Yay. <laughs> I, so I've got an audience question here for Megan. Um, she's very happy that you're here, Mona, because she is deaf. Uh, she wants to know, being in isolation, um, being in, oh, like being in isolation, how can that be an inspiration? Like, how can you be inspired basically when we're stuck in our rooms all day? How are you guys doing this? <laughs> I, I find it's kind of a relief to be working. I, the pitch that I'm working on is a very fantastical, but sort of historic thing. So, you know, you know, it's just nice to dive into some, you know, like world creation and just sort of escape the same way you would. It, it's very similar, I find at the moment to like escaping into a good book. Like I'm like, you know, getting into really getting into these story and these characters and it's just from the angle of creating a show instead of just, you know, reading a book that's already been written, but sort of just like getting into that world and diving in. And it's a nice escape from, you know, the same four walls that we're all <laughs> looking at now. Yeah, yeah. Anybody anybody else want to add to that? I, uh, I have to admit, uh, I walk. I just take very long walks and I'm very fortunate that I live in a beautiful neighborhood in Chicago right now. Um, by a pond and the pond is open. So I just take like, like hour and a half, two hour walks around the pond and um, listen to jazz. And that's what inspires me, honestly. I can't, I'm not the kind of person that can stay inside and uh, come up with an idea. It needs to yeah. be when I'm doing something else. <laughs> can, I mean, like, is there anything that you guys can like, it's hard, we talked about the whole idea of people writing movies or stories about pandemics and quarantine right now, but, uh, you know, I mean, how are we, how are, how are you coming up with other stuff that doesn't have that, <clears throat> that flavor? <laughs> uh, well, for me, um, our, our season ended four episodes early, so, um, and there was a- uh, Is that because of quarantine? Yeah. So, oh. um, so we recently had our, our unplanned season finale uh, last week, but which is a shame because our last four episodes were going to be great. Um, but there was a couple weeks where we thought we might go back to the room and do a, you know, um, work remotely. And so I was coming up with a lot of ideas for the next season. And then when it became clear that we weren't um, going to do that, and I started freaking out about being inside for months, um, I really just decided to take the pressure off and not try to write a pilot, not try to do anything. Um, and I do this in general, but I watch a lot of television and especially in quarantine, it's difficult for me to get outside because I live in a hilly neighborhood and I use a wheelchair. So I spend, I've spent weeks inside watching television and had no plans of coming up with my own idea. But, you know, they always say like, steal from the best. You know, I'm just watching old shows and like, getting a spark of an idea that worked there. So how can I make this my own, make it different, you know, take this and um, run with it. So just yeah. like watch old stuff that inspires you, that has inspired you in the past and see if it sparks anything new. That's a good idea. All right. We've got one more question here uh, from Lindsay. Uh, this, uh, well, I mean, I guess, yeah. I mean, part of planning everything out, uh, although I, this is gonna be a subject of next week's, spoiler alert. Um, <laughs> Uh, edition of this show or episode is going to be all about developing characters and character development. But do you guys have any tips on character development? Because that is something that has been mentioned today as you're organizing your thoughts, as you're outlining and, and breaking story and plotting things out. And you have your characters, any particular things that you do to develop them, especially if they're LGBTQ or have a disability or whatever. Test. Like, I, I mean, go ahead. Test. Oh, I was, I was, I was just gonna say, regardless if the character is a protagonist or an antagonist, I try to give them like a journey that anyone would want to root for. So even if the person is despicable, 
their issue is something a person can feel sympathy for and want to resolve it. <laughs> um, so I find myself like, I'll feel more invested in the characters I'm creating if I'm rooting for them to figure their shit out. Like yeah. they're real. <laughs> yeah. 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 I, I think it's helpful when you're when you're creating characters to, um, as I was saying before, sort of map map out their dynamics so that you know each character has an equally identifiable and urgent want or need that are irreconcilable with, with each other. And then you get a whole lot of story and drama out of that. Mm -hmm. This is, I'm gonna throw one more question. This is from Blue Metric. Um, this is a good question. How do you strike a balance between funny and sad when you're talking about current events? Um, the current events that we're in right now are fucking absurd. This, this, uh, you know, it's absurd. So in situations like that, and I think when I'm writing my own stuff, um, I always try to touch, even when something gets really dark, is, uh, is to get into the absurdity of it so you can actually take a step back and laugh at it in a way. And that's the best way of getting through the darkness is to be able to laugh at it. Um, we're in a, we're, this is an absurd time, man, you know. Uh, yeah. Our country, in it's my ridiculous. opinion, is yeah. absurd at the moment. Yeah. Uh, it's a well, rather than show. getting rather than getting mired in like the, the like is are there any things like uh, I think we've all taken a stab at writing a joke before. So how how I mean when things are this absurd, like is there any particular tricks that you guys have to bring levity to situations that might be uh, depressing? I think gallows humor is probably a big right now. I, I struggle with that because my set points for what's too sad or what's too uncomfortable can be so off often, but I try not to question myself too much. So I will write the joke or I'll write the thing that may possibly upset people. And I will like show it to people I trust whose like taste I really admire and I'll let them tell me. So I will, I will just do it and see how it turns out and then share it and have people tell me if it's too much versus just yeah. debating with myself. Yeah. Yeah. Catherine? Yeah, it's also, uh, yeah, go ahead, Catherine. Oh, I mean, for me, um, I think especially like uh, as a disabled person, you learn to uh, disarm people with humor very early. So I'm almost never not telling a joke uh, just in my general um, uh, everyday life. So, um, so yeah, I, my, my struggle is, is, is not making things too funny because I, that's just where I go. So I'm still working on that. Let me ask, where's, where's the line? Obviously, you know, you, you can use humor and everything and relate it to your disability and having to be in a wheelchair, but where, where's the line when someone who doesn't have a disability starts throwing around jokes that might include disability as part of a punchline or something? Um, I mean, I don't know where the line is. I'll just say usually the jokes aren't very funny because they don't have uh, that experience. You know, it, yeah. it's, like, they might, they might go for it and it's not that they crossed the line it's just that it was a bad joke yeah. Uh, so yeah I, I i don't know that i don't know where there is a line yeah you know yeah. and if you write a character like that i think in this day and age especially if you write a character like that that tells a joke like that uh that character is just an asshole yeah. and, and, and it's yeah. basically just seen it, it's like you know in like tarantino stuff with the language when you know some of those characters are saying the most horrible things and you're laughing at them but they're assholes they're yeah. not looked at as being heroes you know yeah. they're bad people doing yeah. bad things and saying bad things. yeah well i mean like one of the i there's a selfish motivation and uh, uh in asking that question which is you know a lot of times when i'm writing i i do write to have characters that are uh disabled have a disability and I want them to be funny. I want them to be quirky. If I, if, you know, I can tend to be a smart ass. And if I want that character that uh, has cerebral palsy or is blind or is deaf to tell like a joke, it's like, where do I have a place as a person that doesn't identify as having a disability? Like, where can I write that joke? You know, right. at the, at, but I, I also have a large community of people around me, which is before I would show this to anybody, I send it off to them and be like, hey, 
you need to QC this for me because yeah. I don't want to be. Yeah. Yeah. The first step is, is getting to know those people and, and, and learning what they find funny. You know, you, if you're, if you're taking a shot in the dark, like, you know, I, and I, yeah. I, I find most people that, that do just take a shot in the dark actually don't go far enough because yes. they're afraid. Oh, that's not, you can't joke about that. That's, that's sad. Or that, you know, um, so the, the biggest piece of advice, which you've done very well is to immerse yourself in that community. If you want to tell that story. Cool. Well, hey, that's, uh, it's time to go on to our closing segment here, which is the good and the bad and the shameless. So I'm going to ask you guys these three questions, something uh, good that writers can do as a resource uh, to new writers can do to, to become better writers, something bad, something you've experienced uh, either as yourself or with new writers that they should try to avoid doing, and something shameless, which we've already kind of talked about a little bit. Like, what do you do to just like lighten the load while you're in quarantine to have fun if you have writer's block and you're, you can't look at the blinking cursor on the page anymore. How do you ditch that? Uh, you know, whatever that is. So Gerald, I want to start with you, my friend. What is your good? My good? Yeah, what's uh, the good? What, what's, what's, the, what's the good? What's, what's a good resource for new writers to be able to tap into to improve their writing? You know, just from the mo just write I, I it's like and i know i there's this thing in this master class which i'm not going to pay for but i see the trailer <laughs> for it but the guy says don't be afraid to suck you yeah. know uh and i keep saying that and i was like good i got that lesson i don't need to pay for it um nice. you know do you and do I, you have I, a do you do you have a bad what's something that writers shouldn't do that you're like oh here's a common mistake let's nip that in the bud uh, it, it's almost it, the good and the bad is connected. It's like, don't, uh, the bad is to think that if this isn't the thing that I'm done, I can't write, you know, also the, also the thing is like, if you're writing, you're a writer. One of the mistakes I made for a long time was I wasn't going to call myself a writer until somebody paid. Me. But the fact of the matter was I was writing for like 15 years before somebody ever paid me. I was a writer that whole time because I was getting better and I was expressing myself and I was creating things. So if you're sitting down, to, you know, if you're not in the industry and you're sitting down, you want to write. As soon as you turn on a computer, you start writing. You are a writer. As soon as you start expressing and creating, in my, my opinion, you are a writer and don't doubt yourself about that. All right. And what's your shameless? What's your guilty pleasure? What do you do to break writer's block or to uh, get yourself out of the depression of quarantine? <laughs> uh, that, like I said before, man, it's like, I mean, I can say, I can say things I probably shouldn't say. No, uh, <laughs> I, I, I just, I, I'm t the beauty of taking a long walk and listening to jazz, honestly, uh, I feel very fortunate and that, I, I get more inspiration from music than I do for, for me than watching movies or watching other TV shows. Um, I'm also a frustrated, I'm a drummer, as you know, uh, and I have found jazz. I got, I got my pork pie, I got my pork pie drum thrown right back there. <laughs> I just find, I just find jazz to be like uh, stream of consciousness writing and it just inspires me to do stream of consciousness writing. So that's what I awesome. do. Awesome. Thanks, man. Tess, let's go over to you. The good, sure. the bad, and the shameless. All right, the good, a tip I would give is share, at every stage of your writing process, share your progress and share your ideas. Like when you come up with the inkling of an idea for a pilot, share it with people and see how they respond and what they think and what they have to say and incorporate that into how you proceed with the outline and then share your outline and see what people have to say and if they're receptive. When you think, if you're a comedy writer, if you think of jokes, try the jokes out on people and see if they work. And it just helps make it so that when you get to the stage of actually writing the script, it's it's more fun than frustrating. That's been my experience. And uh, the bad, <laughs> um, like just nothing's gonna be perfect ever. And I, I used to do this and I see people doing this, which is they won't stop writing a script until they think it's good. But if if that is the case, I think you should just move on from the script and like accept what you learned. And it wasn't a waste of time because you learned from the mistakes you made. And now you can take that onto a project, next project. And the shameless. I love making um, cashew milk and almond milk and oat milk 
in my blender. And I love testing out different recipes. So adding dates and cinnamon or salt and different ratios. So that, that's really how I de-stress in quarantine is just making nut milks. Awesome. Nice, nice. <laughs> <laughs> sounds delicious like we'll have to meet up sometime i, I want to try some of that <laughs> yeah absolutely yeah, it's super great. simple to make and affordable i've i've recently fallen in love with dates in the last year so now they're like better than halloween candy yeah dates. <laughs> especially if you put them in the fridge Ooh, oh, yeah. I do? Catherine, what about um, you so one good tip i have i don't know what the name of this site is but there's a website that has like a bunch of pilots and television scripts on it. Um, and if you just Google like TV writing, Google site, it will come up. Um, and there's just a ton of pilots and scripts. So when you're first starting out, and even if you're like, if you've been writing for a decade, like I have read as many scripts as you possibly can. Um, just not only for like structure and formatting, but you know, just to see like what works with character and what might inspire you. Um, I'll, I'll try and Google that and add, if I can find the link, I'll add it to the show notes when we're all done. And also I, I'll try to find it and send it to you as well. Um, the bad, I would say this kind of applies to people that are in writer's rooms. Um, but a mistake that I often see is, um, like talking just to talk. I think mm -hmm. it, it, a lot of people, when they first get, they get that staff writer job, they think, oh, I really have to pull my weight. So I'm going to pitch something every 15 minutes. Um, and oh, I would say when you're first starting out, like be an active listener. Don't mm -hmm. pitch unless you, you're confident you're going to hit a home run because um, you're there to learn. Um, and the shameless uh, I've just been binging TV. I, I did Deadwood. I'm on to Justified. I got to find my next Timothy Elephant thing pretty soon because I'm already almost done with it. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I get lost in, in TV for, for hours. So nice. Awesome. And Jen, take us home. What's your good, your bad, and your shameless? Um, I'm going to, for the good, I'm going to, uh, a couple things, but first I'm going to sort of echo what Catherine said about reading a lot, but I would also add, um, you know, all, all the scripts you're going to be able to download are mostly good scripts. Um, when I was in film school, I also was a reader for CAA, a freelance reader. And so I also read a ton of terrible scripts, but when you're a reader and you're doing coverage, you have to explain why. <laughs> you're saying, you know, you're not recommending the script. And what I found what it did was uh, it helped me sort of internalize what a script structure should be. Because if you're reading good scripts, if they're really good, they're kind of hiding the strings, you know, and you want to be able to read some scripts, you know, maybe if it's, you know, if you're in a writer's group and you're working with people, you know, you're going to see that too. But it's good to kind of read scripts where the, you know, the scaffolding is still shoddy and not quite <laughs> in place yet so that you can learn that. Um, I found when I was in film school that a lot of people would get stuck in act two of feature, feature screenplay. Um, and all the, I don't really recommend writer's books because most of them are only good once you have a, or screenwriting books once you have a draft. There's one like very thin book I used to recommend that's that's good, especially what you're talking about, people like wanting to tell their own story. Um, it's called How to Write a Screenplay in 21 Days by Vicki King, V-I-K-I -I King. Um, and it's how I kind of got my first draft out of my first, uh, first feature. Um, so that's the only one I really <laughs> recommend. The rest are good once you actually have a draft. <laughs> there you go. And did you have, let's see, that was your good? Yeah. What's your bad? Um, it's a little, I'm going to a little bit uh, contradict Tess on this. I, I think that you do, or, or sort of combine what Tess said with what Gerald said, which is that, you know, if you're going to be, the best way to learn how to write is to write. Um, I, I find with, because TV and film are so much about structure that a lot of people mistake that to me and I need to write a lot of first drafts of things. Mm -hmm. But where you really learn how to write is by rewriting something until it is good. But to just, you know, what Tess was saying, don't let perfect be the enemy of 
Okay. What's your shameless? What's 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 your guilty pleasure? What gets you out of your head? I, I find I'm on a kind of two day schedule where one day I'll be like really healthy and make I do my meditation practice first thing and I get a run in and then the next day it's like sitting on the couch all day watching something and then baking yeah. and then the next day I'll have to make up for all the baking by getting out and doing all those things again. <laughs> Just back and forth. <laughs> Um, I don't, I don't usually, I, I like to leave the last word with you guys on this sort of stuff, but I heard a tip the other day that I thought was brilliant. And I never heard of this before, which is when you have writer's block, pull out, whether it's online, uh, oh, like, uh, Catherine suggested, pull out, a, or, or if you have a printed one, pull out your a favorite script of yours and open up your screen writing software and just start typing out somebody else's words, start type and just feel their flow, feel their words. And all you're doing is, you know, being a secretary or whatever, you're just typing out somebody else's stuff, but just to get out of your head and see where their act breaks are there. And just, and, and like six or eight pages in, you're like, Oh, well, I know how to fix that thing that was broken before. So that would be my one little tip. And then my thing that gets me out of my head is puppy. Oh, oh. <laughs> this is Hooper. Hooper Hooper. loves to eat my earbuds and she's a handful. Say hi, Hooper. Say hi. Anyway, enough of my dog dad bullshit. Um, (laughs) Let's see, a few thank yous I want to, oh, do you guys have anything to shout out? Do you guys have anything that's uh, online, on Netflix, on Hulu, on Quibi, that's out there right now for people to see, for you to promote, or do do, uh, do you do anything online? Any of you guys in any Dungeons and Dragons groups that are looking for players? (laughs) <laughs> follow me on instagram i'm at test please and i'm i'm just i make memes all the time i'm part of like the meme community it's fun nice i'll have all your guys's uh socials in the show notes um i'm gonna put a link to uh how to write a screenplay in 21 days in the show notes i'll i'll try and uh google that website you're talking about Catherine. or if you want to send it over to me i'll add that in there too um personally i want to thank all of you guys for being here i really appreciate it big round of applause for mona jean our asl interpreter this is applause if you're deaf right here Woo! um and i wanted to say a special thank you to um deborah and alan over at the media access awards they have a, a program going on right now the link will be in the show notes on their facebook page on their instagrams where they are interviewing writers producers directors and actors um that and and their conversations are focusing on disability and inclusion they come out on mondays and thursdays so their links to facebook and instagram will be in our show notes um, I want to thank Nick Novicki from the Easter Seals Disability Film Challenge. He's the guy that introduced me to the need to increase the uh, awareness of people with disabilities in media. I think my dog is going to throw up on my desk. Oh, she totally just did. Oh, no. That's gross. <laughs> oh, live. Look at that. Where'd it go? Where is it? Oh. Ate too fast. <laughs> oh, man. You can't, you, you can't beat live television, folks. Um, anyway, so, uh, check out that on Facebook. Thank all of you guys. Um, I really appreciate it. And uh, we'll be back next week. Thank you so much. Wonderful. (laughs) Thanks guys.